Hey, hey, everybody, hope you're doing well today. Well, let's take a look at the limitations of national income data. So here we have, we've calculated all these GDPs, we got all our friends lined up, we understand everything it is, and it's like, okay, well, but there's limitations, which is the beauty of economics. So let's understand what they are. Okay, first of all, anytime you collect a bunch of uh, um, data, right, there's gonna be inaccuracies. And the data used to calculate the various measures of national income comes some, from an enormously wide range of sources, including tax claims by households, firms, output data, and sales data, right? So there's gonna be inaccuracies in that no matter what. Also, there's gonna be a lag time. Figures tend to be more accurate over time, and, and governments actually go back, responsible governments go back and, and, and adjust them. More developed nations can be assumed to be more reliable in terms of their data, than um, developing nations. And the UN SNAs works with countries to improve data collection. So obviously data collection is really important in order to make sure that the information you have before you make all of your calculations on national income are really, in, are really accurate. Otherwise, you're gonna end up with accurate outcomes. That, that kind of makes sense. Another reason is unreported or under-recorded economic activity. And in every country, there are these informal markets. And the more developed a nation is, the, the fewer these informal markets are. But an informal market would be things like, you know, when I was a kid, I would go to my neighbors and I'd say, hey, would you like, your, would like me to cut your grass? And they'd say yes. And I'd cut their grass and they'd give me $5. Okay. Was that economic activity? Yeah, I just provided a service of cutting grass and I collected $5. Did I report that to the government? No, of course not. Right? So things are underreported or unreported. So it's important to note that national income data accounts only for the recorded activity that has, been, that has been officially presented, right? It doesn't include do-it-yourself work done at home. We lived in Atlanta, Georgia, in the United States for six years, and I completely uh, renovated this house. Beautiful. Did I pay anyone to do that? No. Did the value of my house go up as a result of my labor? Yes. Was that paid work? No. Um, it wasn't recorded at all. So there's another example of the way in which data can be, uh, on for, for national income data measured on a nationwide basis, could be uh, limited or inaccurate. Um, this is most significant in developing countries where much of the output does not make it any, into any recorded market. And food consumption uh, from home, uh, poverty-driven home fixes, right? All of the things that happen, if you go into the hills, and I lived in the Dominican Republic for, for two years as a Peace Corps volunteer, and there's a whole bunch of economic activity that happens up there that isn't recorded. You know, some guy out there, like, you know, planning his own food so that his family can eat, um, that's food consumption by home. Is that accounted for in the national income data? No, not at all, because they're, they're, it's work that really wasn't paid for, right? And then the other thing, and it creates this idea of a hidden economy. A hidden economy is economic activity that goes unrecorded or underrecorded. And examples of this are the obvious things. I think these are obvious, like illegal activities, drug trafficking, payments to illegal immigrants, underreporting of income in high-income tax countries, high indirect taxes, government health and safety standards, all of these sorts of things can create, um, uh, give people an incentive to not really report, right? If there's high government health and safety standards and, the com and a company isn't abiding by them, they have an incentive, if it's gonna cost them a lot to fix it, to not report it. Likewise, if there's high taxes, you know, sometimes you ever gone into a store and you say, hey, you know, if I buy this in cash instead of paying on a credit card, you know, will you give me a deal? And they say yes. Well, that's because then they don't have to report the income on that cash because it's cash instead of something that goes on a credit card, which can be, re can be traced through a bank. Okay, so that creates this hidden income. And of course, that's going to create a limitation on the, the, the reliability of the data that's required or not, that's required to calculate national incomes. Likewise, um, there are external costs GDP figures do not take into account the cost of resource depletion. An example would be like cutting down trees that lead to an increase of GDP, but there's no measure to account for the loss of these trees. So, you know, you think about it as like a stock of, of natural resources. If you chop down a forest to build a bunch of homes, that wood is not replaced. So now, next year, you don't have that stock of resources, which was those trees. And so GDP figures do not make deductions for negative consequences of air and water pollution and traffic congestion as they are external costs. And these external costs will compromise quality of life even as GDP rises, which is why 
if you've seen the video on green GDP, green GDP takes into account the environmental damage done by uh, a country in a given year and subtracts it from the GDP. And here are the last two limitations on the GDP data. The first thing is other quality of life concerns. GDP may grow even as people are working longer hours or taking fewer holidays, which leads to a decrease in the standard of living. Likewise, GDP accounting does not include the free activities, quote unquote, such as volunteer work or people caring for the elderly and children at home. You know, if, a, if, if one of the parents is staying in the house taking care of its children, that is work, but it's not being taken into account in terms of GDP. And of course, these activities lead to a better society, right? Taking care of the elderly and children at home leads to a better, to a better society, but in terms of like hard-nosed GDP, you know, that's not contributing to the economic growth. And lastly, the composition of the output is the last limitation on data for national income. And it's possible that a large part of a country's output is in goods that do not benefit consumers, such as defense goods or capital goods. And this is, this is when this, if this is the case, then it would be hard to argue that a higher GDP will raise the standards of living. If a, of a country, if the GDP of a country goes up and all the country is building is a bunch of new missiles or a bunch of new military um, uh, military installations, is that really contributing to the overall well-being of a country? Maybe, but really there's not really a common um, uh, like benefit from that sorts of um, calculation or that sorts of addition to the gross domestic product of a particular country. Okay, so you need to have all of those ideas in your head. Those are the limitations on GDP. I hope you found this video to be helpful, and we'll talk to you in a bit.